。那我们就再次 welcome 大家 Emory。Well, we have a long day ahead of us.、Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to、uh, our moderator for that kind introduction. We've—I、uh, feel like we're already friends with many of these folks here already. I also want to thank、uh, the Chinese Academy of Implant and Aesthetic Dentistry and the Taiwan Academy of Perioprosthodontics. It's a real honor. To be asked to speak to such a prestigious organ, two such prestigious organizations, and、uh, and again, High Clearance has been so gracious. We've、uh, I've gotten to visit your、uh, museums, and had some fantastic meals already. So、uh, I was full last night, I can tell you, and I had a great breakfast this morning. When I say I feel like I have friends here already, we've had some visitors. We've had two groups from Taiwan. Come to our clinic to visit and watch surgery, and on both occasions, I was really impressed with the level of sophistication with your group.、Um, and then the other day, I was looking on the internet about I don't know a week ago, and what do I see? One of my visitors doing surgery with the X guide, and I was just thrilled when I saw that. So. Again, I feel like I have friends here, and I've never been here, never been to Asia. This is the first time I've ever been to this part of the world, and it's been wonderful so far. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't say thank you to all my colleagues in Washington that send me patients. I'm an oral and maxillofacial surgeon, and I'm dependent upon these people. And the one in the middle, right here, is、uh, Dr. Progman, and he and I speak together. Quite often in the United States, and you're going to see a lot of his work. He's a prosthodontist, and you're going to see a lot of the work of my other colleagues. When、uh, they, I was asked to do this, I was told that you are a sophisticated group, and then I needed to really step this up. So you're going to see the, be the beginning and the basics of the stuff, but then you're going to—I'm going to show you some real nice aesthetics, and I'm going to talk about some of the dentistry because this is about dentistry. So my only disclosure is that I have a proprietary interest in XSnap technologies. I do not have any other conflicts. So, what are we going to do today? I'm going to talk to you about computer-assisted surgery, and I'm going to try to convince you that any form of computer-assisted surgery is better than freehand. Then I'm going to try to convince you that there's only one form of computer-assisted surgery that's efficient. Okay. That's going to make you faster, okay? And that doesn't cost too much, because if it's not efficient and if it's not cost-effective, you're not going to do it. And then, if I've convinced you of those two things, you're going to come to your own conclusion, and this is what I hope it is: that you're going to guide every patient, every implant, every time, because that's what I do. Now, when I look at a、uh, new Any new、uh, device or any new procedure, I always want to know why should why, why should I bother change? This is Gordon Christensen, and in the United States, he's he's very well known、uh, prosthodontist. He is regularly、uh, writes in the American Dental Association and comments on dentistry. And one of the things that he said was, the driving principle of innovation is change. And this is in this article that it, from nine, in 2015. And in my opinion, in the profession today, there are three drivers. And what are they? Aesthetics, implant dentistry, and technology. And then he goes on to say that he's talking about implants in this section. He says, if you don't have a cone beam, I strongly suggest that you get access to one. He didn't say you had to buy it, but you need to have one accessible, because he believes. That it's going to become the standard of care in the United States, and I agree with them. Today, I hope that you will look at the bottom line and say, "This is why why you're going to choose to use this technology because you're going to use your judgment, and I am going to give you evidence to base your judgment on the technology. I'm not going to just say, 'Oh, it's better.' I'm going to show you evidence, good studies." To say why you should do it, and then you're going to use your professional judgment to come to conclusions. So where are we right now? 
the majority of dental implants are placed with no 3D imaging and they're also placed freehand. And you're going to look on the, on the left of the screen and then on the right of the screen. The left of the screen is the way they were placed with two-dimensional imaging. And this patient says, why are my implants failing? Well, it's obviously why they're failing because they weren't put in in a three-dimensional fashion. They tried to do minimal invasive surgery and they couldn't look and they couldn't see. Again, same patient, why are my implants failing? Why do I have peri-implantitis in the bottom? Because they weren't put in with vision. They used 2D imaging, they didn't use 3D imaging. And what are we gonna have to do? Remove the implants, do site development. Why is my lip numb? You look on that bottom left, or bottom right of that screen and you're gonna see because they put the implant right up against the nerve. Now that patient was completely numb for six months and now has a paresthesia. And now the implant's fractured and I need to remove it. This is after I've removed it and I'm gonna show you how I did that with the X-Guide. Why are my implants failing when I just had them put in six months ago? There was no CT, there was no site development because they couldn't see they needed to do site development. And this is less than six months. And the CT shows us why there's no bone. So all these cases have walked into my office in the last year or so. This walked into my office last week. Why, are my, why am I gonna lose this tooth? Why are my implants failing? This one implant down here doesn't look too bad, does it? But then look at it on the CT. I have to remove that implant. Why did my implant break? Why do I have food stuck under my implant all the time? Now this is common. I've done that. The implant's a little distal. So we create a pocket mesially. Food gets impacted there. Why? Because it's only about a millimeter and a half, two millimeters distal. And I'm gonna show you why that happens. Why did that implant fracture? Now, there's no, this patient was last week came in last week. I'm in constant pain. The patient came in to have implants number uh, 14 and 15 placed. Only 15 could be restored. So what did they do? They prepped the two mesial teeth and put a cantilever on. And then they overloaded tooth number 13, which needed endo, and now tooth number 12 needs endo. And why did that implant not be restored? Because the implant's coming through right on the palatal aspect. I'm gonna show you why this happens, okay? Parallax. This is why, free, I don't care who you are, we're all subject to the same biological principles of binocular vision. If you take your finger and put it in front of you and look with your right eye and aim at one a person, and then look at the left, it shifts. That's called parallax. Now let's look at it, how it affects us when we're doing surgery and we're looking down into the mouth. We, can, we can't see the restorative space. We can only see what is in our vision. Even if we move over, we just shift the parallax. Now how big is a, is a molar? 10 millimeters. So if you're off two millimeters or three millimeters, that's 20 to 30% of the restorative space. And that's just mesial distal. What happens? You can't see the lingual or the palatal aspect, so you shift the implants to the buckle. So this is why you can't see because of parallax. How about the old, and this is, this is the minimum standard of care, I believe, in the United States, is an analog model-based implant placement. This is a case of Dr. Progamins from years ago where he measured and he determined exactly where he wanted it on, in, the, uh, uh, in the scheme, the occlusal scheme. And let's see what happens if we put the implants where he told us to put them with 2D vision. Only one of those three implants is restorable. One of them would fail grossly. Now, what did we do? What did I used to do these splints? I'd lay a flap and look and then aim it through. And the splints were almost useless. When we look at the literature, you're going to see they're no better than freehand. And this is just last month in the JOMI, or just recently in JOMI, and this explains why you have to have three-dimensional imaging. 
before we made big incisions, the good surgeons looked, and we adjusted for our lack of vision. So where should you be today? Where do you want to be? You want to be in the digital world. You want to be in the 3D world. You want to communicate with your restorative colleagues if you're a surgeon, and you want to know what you're going to do if you're doing everything. When I work with my surgical, uh, my restorative colleagues, I use join me on the computer and we look at the plans together. Now what's the big, I think is a big deal now, is the ability to fuse different kinds of data sets. Intraoral STL files from intraoral scans and DICOM files from 3D CTs. We can merge those. The STL files have a 25 micron resolution. And what is the resolution of a CT? 200 to 400 microns. On top of that, you have a lot of scatter and artifact that blurs your vision. So when you superimpose a 25 micron surface rendering from an intraoral scan, and if you don't have an intraoral scan, there's ways of getting these without it. On top of that 400 micron image, you can actually turn off the CT and plan the case occlusally with the 25 microns and then look at the bone in detail and relate the two. And then I can get on the internet and use join me and I don't have to interfere with my restorative colleagues day and we can look at it and we can tweak the case together because I'm never going to pretend I know much about, as much about prosthetics as he does. And he doesn't pretend he knows as much about surgery as I do. So what's the next step? Digital diagnostics, we need that. I've showed you why we need that. Digital collaboration, if you're working with a team, then we need computer-assisted surgery. This is the next logical step. Before, we couldn't do it. Now we can. This is what the X-Guide is all about. So what's computer-assisted surgery? Computer-assisted surgery is using diagnostic imaging, 3D, and computer-based CAD tools to plan your restorative and your surgical plan. There's two forms, basically. There's dynamic navigation and static na uh, guides. The advantage of dynamic navigation, it's real time. You can alter your plan immediately, anytime, just like you do today. Now there's, in the United States, X-Guide and Navident are the, really the only two uh, systems available. And in Europe, there's RoboDent. RoboDent was one of the first with everything. So this is really important. You gotta look this, you really need to understand this. Dynamic navigation is guided free hand surgery. It's what you're doing today with enhanced vision. So everything you're doing today, you can do with that machine over there, but you're gonna see everything. You're gonna be able to see the threads of the implant affect the implant as it goes in. You're gonna be looking at micron level. The dynamic navigation uses light and software. What's important about that? There's nothing physical there. That means with software adjustments, we can use light in the future to do other things. So you have all the flexibility that you have today. Anything you can do today, you can do it with dynamic navigation. You have all that flexibility, you have all that efficiency, but you have amazing vision, no parallax. Dynamic navigation is not just for implants. It's just not for one technique, it's for many things. Think of it like a scalpel. It's a scalpel that you can control with your thoughts, light and software. Anything you can think of doing that you want to guide, you're going to be able to use that machine in future because we're going to be able to write software for it. It's sort of like an iPhone or a handheld device. Just think what you started out doing, all you can do is make a call and keep a, a log of people and now you can do so many things with it. 
So that's the way you need to look at that device. It's not just for implants. So how does dynamic navigation work? You need a simple workflow. You've got to put some fiducials in the mouth. That's today. That's not in the very near future. You won't even need to do that. You have to take a CBCT with the fiducials in the mouth, and then you have to calibrate instru instruments. And I'm going to go through this in more detail as the day progresses. Then you've got to plan the case. Now, everything I've showed you up to now, I don't do. I have nothing to do with it in my office. My staff does it all. They even load the files and do the initial plan. So how efficient have I done anything? Now I have to tweak the plan. I have to look at the plan. I have to approve it because they're not good enough to do that. Not yet. And then I guide. So here's a little video on just the basics of how, how, what it looks like while you're doing it. This is Dr. Robert Emery demonstrating the use of the X guide. After we measure drill length, we touch an adjacent tooth to ensure accuracy of guidance. We select the tooth using the mouse. We then center the tip of the drill, the blue dot, over the target, which indicates ideal position. Let's center the target. As we drill, the depth is indicated by the color. It's yellow until we reach the 45 degree spot on the clock. When we reach that position, it will turn green. The ideal angle is indicated by the top of the drill, which is a white circle. When we reach that depth, it turns green. We're then going to select the other tooth, do a quick system check, which only takes seconds. We then center the drill over the target. As we drill down, again, the color indicates depth. When we reach the maximum depth and go beyond it, it goes from green, which is the ideal depth, and then it will turn red and we go past the ideal depth, indicating we've gone a little too far. Thank you very much. So, some important definitions because you want to understand the principles behind the machine. You have the CT volume, we all know what that is, and it has an XYZ coordinate system. Every voxel has a, a coordinate. You have the surgical tracking volume, and that's the area that is imaged by the cameras, and it also has an XYZ coordinate system to it. When we register a patient, we align the XYZ coordinates of the CT volume with the XYZ coordinates of the surgical tracking volume, and we use the patient tracking array to do that. And when we've done that, it's called registration, and that dynamic, that uh, patient tracking array then becomes what we call the dynamic reference frame. It's the object that keeps everything oriented. When we calibrate an instrument, what we're doing is measuring the geometry of that instrument or that device relative to the guiding uh, of, of the relative to the tracking arrays. Now these are the, all the components of the system that you want to look at when you're evaluating these systems that affect precision and I'm going to go through a few of them. The computer is important because you want your system to be robust. You want to, most of the time, a dedicated computer system that's made just for uh, tracking is going to be better than uh, a, like a laptop. Large monitors are important. When I tell you I don't look in my patient's mouth when I play in, place implants, your colleagues that have seen me operate are going, to, are going to tell you I don't look in the mouth. I can close the mouth when I'm doing this, and I do it often. So you want a big monitor. You don't want to be bending over and straining to look at a little dinky screen. Obviously, cameras are important. You've all, you're all doing photography of doing aesthetic dentistry. The difference between the camera you're using and the, the two cameras here is their stereo for stereo vision. You still have a depth of field. You still have a focal distance, and resolution obviously is important. This is something you might not think of. The difference between the cameras is called a surgical baseline, and there's a sweet spot relative to the distance of the object you're tracking to the width of that surgical tracking array that you want to go into. If they're too small, you're giving up something in order to make it smaller. So again, there's a lot of complexity here, but you want 
that sweet spot to keep the cameras and the objects out of your way when you're operating. The digital analog interface, the fiducials, they have to be rigidly fixed to the patient. They need to be close to the area that you're going to surgery. They need to, uh, they have to hold the surgical tracking array and the fiducials, and they, this is really a big deal. They need to be easy to fabricate. If you have to do expensive lab work, that just raises your fees and you're not going to want to do it. Now, the same thing goes for the patient tracking array. They don't want it too big. This is the predicate device that I started with a few years ago, about 10 years ago. And this is active. Those lights are blinking. And it's got a wire on it that tends to displace it. These are other systems that came from the medical world, and they're reflective or passive. This is another system that's available today. And you'll see it's big. It gets in the way. This is the X-Guide tracking arrays. They're small, and they stay out of the way. But again, if you make them too small, then they don't track as accurately. You're going to see some systems that are coming out that are really tiny. But if you block even a portion of it, it stops tracking. So again, like everything in life, there's a sweet spot, a balance, and you've got to find that balance. This is the instrument tracking array, and you don't want it too big. Last month, we published a, a series of third molar extractions that I did about five years ago. And I used this object. It's heavy as hell. And this was not with the X guy. This is, again, the pre predicate device. <laughs> This is again comes from the medical world, and this is one of the prototypes for the XNAV. This is a one book previously. It's smaller. And again, these are small enough that they stay out of the way, but they're sort of big. And if you block any of them or you change the angles too much, they don't track well. Now, this is what's going on deep in these pictures when you look today. You're going to see these windows down here, and you're going to see these blinking lights. And when everything's tracking well, you get a sense of it gets bright. And why is it getting bright? It's because the machine's telling you the quality of your tracking. If you blow this up, you're going to see, oh my goodness, look what this thing is tracking. It's tracking every corner in there. That's called X-corner technology. And it creates a three-dimensional object that's this purple thing so that you can, you can cover it up, part of it, and it'll still track. That means it's robust. And that's what you want in any engineering. You want robustness. So even if you co cover up part of the trackers, it's still going to track. Software is a big deal. You want it to be intuitive. And everything on here flows from left to right. You just keep clicking as you go along. So you want it to be implant-centric when you plan. That means everything's oriented to the implant. You have to have virtual teeth, so you don't have to do as much lab work. You must have STL superimposition again, so you can get the, the, uh, uh, the uh, 25 micron accuracy of the CT scans. You want things to be generic because people like different implants. I have five different implant systems in my office, and I use them for different things. And it should you allow you to make provisionals ahead of time. This is something you're not used to, the tracking software. You can't look at six degrees of freedom in this, in this uh, tracking system without looking at three windows. This is the original one. Position, pitch roll, yaw, the angle, and depth. With the X-Guide software, position is the blue dot, then the top of the drill has got a white circle on it, and you center it over the blue dot on the X, and then the depth is indicated by color as you go down. So you can see six degrees of freedom in one view. Now, what's the first thing that every dentist does when they put a drill in the mouth? You get a finger rest. Why do you do that? Because you're removing some of these six degrees of freedom. You're making the system simpler, and you don't even know that you're doing it. It's intuitive. You're taking away these degrees of freedom. We can only concentrate on one or two things at a time. The third thing gets difficult. You don't have to concentrate on depth. All you have to see is that color. You can drill away and concentrate on your, the X and the circle and keeping that blue dot on the center of the point and not pay any attention to depth. And as soon as you see the green go, you slow down. So you have six degrees of freedom. Now let's talk about static guides. I used a lot of static guides. 
I haven't put in an implant freehand in probably 10 years. Okay? Why? It costs me more, but I knew the literature about static guides and dynamic guidance. You have to fabricate these ahead of time, and you can't alter them. But before dynamic guidance, this was better than freehand. There's a lot of different systems. There's open and there's closed. Proprietary systems that the implant companies have. And then there's different kind of static guides. Pilot hole guides, tooth supported, mucosal supported, bone supported. You also have bone reduction guides. And I'm going to show you why those are really necessary with this. They're not necessary for, for dynamic guidance. Those are a result of using these. You got extraction guides. Zygoma guides only draw, give you entry point. That's it. And then analog models for making provisionals. This is all hot. These kind of, I call them hybrid or foundation guides. All as these guys do is engineer out the slop that's in the systems so that your reline is going to be a little easier. That's all they really do, and they're real expensive, but they're better than freehand. Any of the, these are all fabricated in different ways. They can be milled, they can be printed, and then mechanical position devices are like the Strauman system. But what do they all have in common? And this is the very important thing that everybody overlooks, these tubes. Those tubes are key to these, all these systems, and there's all these different geometries, and they're starting to open them up uh, from the side in order to make up for some problems with these guides. But they all have sleeves. They all uh, also have pretty complicated drill sets with uh, positioners and analog uh, prosthetic parts to make things ahead of time. Now you can have these manufactured by the implant companies, or labs, or in office. This is real hot in the United States. People want to print their, their guides in their office because it's such a pain in the neck to send them out. But there's no data at all on these printed in-office guides. So I've showed you that. I'm going to go through the differences between the dynamic guidance and the static guidance as we go along a little farther. But I need to give you some evidence. This is the thing that you really need to see in order to be an evidence-based doc, based doc. This evidence that I'm going to give you gives you the ammunition to make that professional judgment. How can I reduce the risk for my patient and improve my outcomes? Does it really do that? Does it make it easier for my restorative team or you yourself if you're restoring? This is a big deal and nobody wants to admit it, but cost and time, are, if it isn't cost efficient and it isn't uh, time efficient, you're just not going to do it. And everybody ignores this, but as I was talking to your president today, we're both about the same age, we've been in this for 30 years, and my back's starting to hurt me. So I'm looking for ways of improving my ergonomics. You need a compelling reason to change. The bottom line for your patients is that they don't care about any of that. They want it to be convenient, they want it to cost less, and they, they all know, because they're not stupid and they read the, the paper, that minimally invasive is good. And you cannot do minimally invasive surgery unless you guide. So what, is the, uh, what does the literature say? First, a couple definitions. Accuracy. Accuracy is the degree of closeness between a measurement and a measurement's true va value. This target is high accuracy and low precision. What's precision? Precision is the degree to which measures under the same conditions are unchanged. It's the standard deviation of the mean deviation. This target, high precision and low accuracy. So what do your patients deserve every time? They deserve high accuracy and high precision. If you can give that to them, why wouldn't you do that? When we don't have a good roadmap, bad things happen. So we want to avoid bad things because we need a good roadmap. So you need to be able to plan ahead of time. So let's see man versus machine. This first study is a model study. This is a meta-analysis that I did with Scott Merritt. He's our chief scientist. 
and we reviewed all the literature for static guides we use meta-analysis there's two of them Young's and Thomas Ebbs they're both published and for the dynamic systems we use the 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 literature that was published by the companies that is available in peer-reviewed literature so first thing how do you do when you do freehand every measure it doesn't matter whether it's angular deviation entry point or apex freehand is terrible now why do you care about model data model data gets gives you the opportunity to look at the system itself it takes out the clinical environment the patient so you should see the best these systems can do with model data when you're looking at the data cadaver uh, studies are equivalent to models there's really no difference the outcomes are almost always the same so how does the X guide do this is published this isn't just what we say this is in the literature and we have available if you go to the X guide uh, website or to my website all this data where do static guides fall they're here they're good there's nothing wrong with them the problem is they're a pain in the neck so let's look at some more literature this is a human split mouth randomized prospective uh, study partially densely right side analog of uh, like the extent the it's not made with CAD cam and left side or or the other side would be a static guide and the important thing is to look at this number here is the angular deviation because that's the one we're really bad at because of parallax this is a static guides there's freehand and you're going to see these numbers six and above freehand all the time it's over and over again and you want to see numbers around three or below for any form of guidance now that's a level one study here's another level one study human randomized prospective edentulus this was done by a periodontist in Belgium it's a fantastic study this believe it or not was the first study that ever documented freehand implant placement in the world okay look how we do freehand and these are edentulous patients look at our entry points what's the average size of a molar 10 millimeters that's 30 percent you wonder why it's so hard to restore these cases how do the static guides do you're around three and we're getting down here okay we can improve on those but that's still good now this is the first study that and the only one that compares freehand the same surgeons to dynamic and this was the first hundred cases we did and this is my my dad is in here this is how good I am look how good we did with dynamic our entry points are under a millimeter so we go from over a millimeter to under a millimeter we go from almost eight millimeter or eight degrees down to around three so this is a meta-analysis of fully guided versus partially guided now why would I show you that what does that mean fully guided means the implants are delivered to depth with the the implant holder with static guides with dynamic guidance we define it as greater than 50 percent delivered with the systems and if we look again the numbers are under a millimeter and three we're, we're below three degrees with fully guided with partially guided we're not quite as good but we're still way better than freehand a lot of people are advocating two millimeter twist drill guides and this is what you're getting okay you're not getting fully guided so you're not getting as much out of the system as you can now this is our data this is the largest database of guided surgery ever published okay where we have freehand compared to uh, guided this is all with uh, dynamic navigation we have a large enough data set now almost 500 patients and 700 implants that we could break out partially and fully guided in every measure when we switch and we guide more we are statistically significantly improved p.05 every measure so the more you guide this data screams at you 
the better you're going to be. And I don't care who you are, because this data is for master surgeons. Every one of these published, these docs do, you know, more than 500 implants a year. They know what they're doing. So you can't say, oh, I, I do better than that. No, you don't. This is the published data. This is where you are when you freehand. This is where you will be when you guide. And this is the same data in a graphic form. This is freehand. Excuse me. This is, yes, uh, freehand. This is dynamic navigation, fully guided. Every measure, statistically significant improvement. So how about the outcome? How about the outcome? Does it affect the outcome? Well, we know implants integrate. Even when you put them in terribly, they integrate. So the, out the outcomes don't change, so the systems don't make it worse, and that's what you need to understand. There is no change, and these are the two biggest databases, their meta-analysis, that are available. So, if you're honest with yourself, and if you're analytic, Guided surgery, any kind of computer-assisted surgery, is more accurate and precise than freehand. So why aren't people guiding? It's obvious. It's a pain in the neck. So I'm going to stop now. Are there any questions? We're, we're going to continue. I just want to know if there's any questions.